Last time on Dragon Ball Z, Cell went full Minecraft creative mode and began engineering the ring for what he would dub the Cell Games, a tournament in the vein of the Earth's Strongest Under the Heavens tourney where he intends to royal rumble every last able-bodied creature on the planet and once he emerges victor, he'll smoke the entire planet and begin his reign as the most powerful creature there. Goku and Gohan emerged from their training in the time chamber early, and their friends were eagerly expecting the good news from Goku on how his newly gained powers will allow him to pack up Cell nice and easy. What they got was a different story entirely, however, with Goku in no uncertain terms letting them know that he fully intends to get Yamcha stepping up to the plate with Cell. With most of his excitement coming from the opportunity to test himself against a force of nature as strong as what Perfect Green had become. Despite the pure horror of this statement, Goku seemed as nonchalant as ever placing priority on quality time with his family and relaxing with them over any sort of last minute training regimen. And so the countdown to the Cell Games began, with the Sun family entering all manner of filler hijinks while the remaining Z Warriors got active in the time chamber and began writing their wills as Doomsday quickly approached. One thing I gotta touch on with y'all real quick though is the backstory of Trunks the Goat that gets briefly touched on in the manga around this point. Outside of my mandatory glaze into the future homie, I want to talk a bit about some of the differences I peeped in the manga version versus the broadcast version of the History of Trunks, because I never realized how different they were. I grew up watching the History of Trunks movie on Toonami, and it's one of the goaded DBZ specials to this day, not only for the godlike choreography, but largely for the overall tone of everything. The broadcast team did a great job of making Trunks' future truly feel desolate and hopeless. The empty streets, the game of cat and mouse, and the guerrilla warfare with the androids, the whole special felt more like playing a session of Outlast than anything DBZ related, and I think that vibe is really what made it so memorable. Reading the manga for the first time, I was immediately caught off guard when literally on the first page of the story, this man Trunks was already a Super Saiyan out here when he was thrown down with biggest brother Gohan. Had me staring at the screen like that emoji with the monocle saying, huh? Because this moment was saved as a big breakthrough climax in the broadcast version, and it had me all kinds of jumble. Another huge difference was how little fighting there actually was in the manga version. In the broadcast special, we got a good three Royal Rumbles of Batman and Robin getting pieced up by the Olsen twins. But the manga version has a total of zero hands being thrown. The most we get are Gohan's torpedo drop kick from the top rope on Hansel and the aftermath of the carnage that comes. Much respect has got to be given to the homie future Gohan though, Buddy was out here with a grand total of one arm getting absolutely busy with the androids in this timeline. Them fellas can't even imagine what kind of demonic activities that man would have had in store for them if he had his good three point arm still intact. I gotta ask though, what was in the water in this timeline bro? because these androids were absolutely bugged out. Jero really had Dante and Virgil out here programmed off of that Lataria Milton protocol. Yes. Why are you here? Cause I'm a bad kid. I do bad things. Out here doing hood rat activities simply for the sake of it. Also, and this is mad random, I know, but can we just talk about how young Trunk stays getting neck chopped by his father figures out here? Both Big Bro Gohan and Majin Vegeta out here tenderizing the back of this fellow's neck before going on a Sudoku mission. If you ever out in the field and you see Trunks catch a neck chop, that's your cue to run, buddy, because you can guess with 100% accuracy that someone's getting put in the pack. By far though, the most unintentionally funny thing to come out of the history of Trunks special was in the manga version, where we get Trunks coming off of a time skip telling his mom that he's finally trained up enough to dirt nap the androids, so the next time he can track him down, he's going to box. Bulma never wanted to filter the truth, even though her own son is like, look little buddy, you know I love you, do you really think you're so much stronger than Gohan was that you can just hop off the porch and deal with Hall and Oates knowing damn well what happened to him? But it was already too late, Trunks Vegeta DNA was firing on all cylinders, so little homie grabbed his poking stick, suited up and told his mom this next fate is for all the hitters they lost and he'll be back before dinner. Then we get a Spongebob segue that's like a few moments late out and our perspective shifts to a hospital bed with Trunks staring at the ceiling in a full body cast and his mom was like told you so Toriyama did this fella so wrong man I actually don't know what's worse the Looney Tunes level ass beating he got in the manga or the curb stomping he caught in the anime the androids were doing this child so grimy man the androids versus trunks fight in the anime actually gives me anxiety bro because you can just feel how hopeless dude is but he finally achieved super saiyan status and has been training up for this moment where he can finally pour 40 out for all the people he had stolen from him then when man's 
finally makes contact, he is utterly helpless to do a damn thing. The whole fight has the same energy as when someone tries to fight their sleep paralysis demon in a nightmare, and it's even worse knowing that for the androids this whole thing was just a Tuesday. They were playing with trunks from second number one, cracking jokes just as quick as they were cracking bones. The whole time young bull trunks is trying to fight back tears, thinking of how trash his timeline is. Future Trunks' life is truly a whole ass horror movie, y'all. I'm so glad little dude caught a break in the form of that time machine because he 1000% did not deserve to be going through everything he was going through back home. And after narrowly escaping the ass beating of a lifetime, the history of Trunks special ends, giving us a bit more context into Future Trunks' life in Gotham as we move forward to the climax of this arc with the beginning of the Cell Games. The nine days of training and hijinks have passed and it is finally the day of the tournament. The first fighter we catch up is none other than Goku, who after knocking the cobwebs off his wife has begun to lace up and is ready for the scrap of a lifetime. Chi Chi wishes her hubby well, but asks him to promise that he won't put Gohan in danger by making him fight in the games. Goku then does what he does best, lies to his wife, leaving her pregnant and alone before teleporting over to a lookout to gather the remaining troops for the upcoming brawl. When Goku arrives, he's immediately overwhelmed by how rancid the vibes are. Big green, krill, trunks, everybody on the top of the tower looks like they're already halfway to HFIL before Goku's finally like, yo, what the hell's wrong with y'all? They all stare at him like he's brain damaged before Big Krill speaks up and it's like, what you mean what's wrong with this? I'm a whole ass human getting ready to square up a cell. Need I say more? This man Goku just laughs and tells Krillin that he's bugging. All they gotta do is not die. But before he can even begin to explain to Goku how unhelpful of a response that is, the man has already begun his flight to the tournament destination after hearing that Vegeta had headed out some time ago eager for his get back. The scene then transitions to the location of the tournament where we see an excited perfect green counting down the seconds like Christmas morning till he gets to feast on the Z fighters. But there is one piece of Steiner mass Cell forgot to account for. A fighter so great, his entrance to the tournament is preordained by the gods themselves to change the tide of the current timeline. No, I'm not talking about Perk Angle. This introduction is for none other than the legendary Hercule Satan. I cannot tell y'all how much I used to hate this man's guts as a kid. The way that his arrogance made him instantly unlikable for me, and the treatment I was hoping he would get from Cell might have got me put in a psych ward. But as time goes on, this man has grown on me, and I find him to be pure comedy. Buddy is just so far out of his depth with zero awareness that you can't help but look on in amazement at how dude has just managed to live this long. Now the crazy part with Hercule Satan is that we all out here calling Buddy light work compared to the Z fighters and we know that's an understatement. But I think we sometimes forget just how massive a freaks of nature those dudes are. Talking in purely human terms with no key control, Hercule would easily curb stomp most dudes he's walking into a dojo with. One thing that I would no lie pay to see would be a dojin or even just some kind of chart of the characters from other anime that Mr. Satan would absolutely wash. Because my money is on the fact that if he was in a different universe, homie would actually do an insane level of work in any other series but Dragon Ball. Do you not remember that part of the anime where this man Hercule is pulling three semi trucks into the arena before cutting his promo? As much as you might get on your nerves, you gotta admit that there's truly ain't a lot of humans out here walking around there about to do all that. Dude is high key annoying and is massively out of his league, but I had to give him his flowers for just a second because it's easy to forget what type of time Hercule is on when he's in a world full of demons like this. Mr. Satan pulls up to the games just like everything he does is pure comedy. Man pulls up in the Satan mobile with his chauffeur with a damn cap and cloak combo and the first thing this man does when he exits the whip is put his arms up in victory and declaring the fight won. What continues is just a disrespect montage with Mr. Satan calling over the news broadcast team to jump into the ring where he proceeds to literally show his ass to sell while roasting him into oblivion while all the civilians at home are getting gassed up thinking this man is really earth safe. Savior. Mr. Satan is an appropriate name for this dude. Bro is quite literally an author of confusion, building his whole empire off of lying and manipulating others, falsely proclaiming himself to be the savior of the people while leading them to destruction out of hubris. Toriyama is actually cooking on this one. After Satan was done cutting his promo, the prince of all promos himself had arrived to the scene looking saltier than ever and raring to get his rematch in with perfect green. The interviewer made his way over to get a few words from the prince, who was quick to tell him that he has five seconds to remove that device from his face before it's installed in a location he will instantly regret. 
Vegeta's a natural born heel, man. You love to see it. After Vegeta's arrival, old Uncle Hasselhoff showed up to the ring next, fresh off his new upgrades at the Brief Estate. Following him, the Z Fighters could be seen gliding in next, all stanced up like an early 2000s boy band geared up for the fight of their lives. Cell couldn't help but smirk at their arrival, marveling at the entrance of the Z Fighters with the same energy as a high school kid seeing their prom day hop out of the limo for the first time. And just like a teen on prom night, Cell had just one thing on his mind, beating the Z Warriors' cheeks into submission. As the final hour approached, the Warriors made small talk, with 16 approaching Brick Krill and thanking him for the assist, because it's his support that allowed him to get patched up over at the Briefs Estate and made his attendance here possible. And it's here that 16 and Goku finally get their introduction to one another, and the interaction couldn't be funnier. Being the kind of guy he is, Goku rolls up to Hasselhoff and is like, put her there giving a standard friendly greeting of luck in hopes that they'll do their best out there. I almost lost it. This man Hasselhoff just stares at Goku for a few seconds, and I promise you can almost see the code in his programming fighting off the intrusive thoughts, not the power bomb and hell flash this man into a different timeline. By sheer force of will, cooler heads prevail, but Hasselhoff reminds Goku that the entire purpose of his being was to send him packing, and he would do very well not to forget that anytime soon. As Hasselhoff makes his way back to the corner, Goku just kind of leaves his hand out for a minute like, good commie in heaven, what in the hell did I do to deserve that? Before shaking the cobwebs off and limbering up, intending to be the first one on the list to try his hand at the Cell Games. That is, until another brave soul steps up to the plate, assuring Goku that the ensuing conflict is no place for an amateur like him, and he would do well to leave this to a real powerhouse. That's right, none other than Mr. Satan has decided that enough attention has been paid to these nobody-ass country bumpkins, and it's time for a real martial artist to go to work. Goku is a benevolent soul and tries his best to convince the curly-headed minstrel to rethink his choices. Upon hearing this, the broadcast team as well as all the NPCs watching the state of affairs back at home start cooking Kakarot up like the last bratwurst on the 4th of July, telling this bleach blonde, dusty, gee having a random to get the hell off the screen and let the savior of the earth cook. This is not the time to be Instagram clout chasing when real men are trying to work. With a meat riding reaching critical mass, Satan decides to give the people one last show, pulling out a capsule with a bunch of bricks and karate chopping through all of them except one, entertaining the fans and giving Cell one last chance to retreat before Daddy pulls up the feast. The Z Fighters and Cell's reaction to this are priceless. While the announcer and the rest of the masses are glazing Hercule up like his last call at Duncan, Krill and Roshi are on their 50 cent mini men timing, literally wishing death upon this dude, while the rest of the Z Fighters, including Cell, are like, I have truly never seen someone this brain dead in my entire life. After this testosterone filled display of hairy nutsack energy from Satan in the manga, the man stances up and begins his flaccid offensive on Cell. But in the broadcast version, we get treated to a TV only trio of characters as Poison, Zangief, and Vega emerge from an aircraft in the sky and are introduced as protégés of the one and only Hercule Satan. It's decided that this cell business is not worthy of dirtying Satan's hands, so his disciples will take care of it and save their master the trouble. The battle ends in an absolute whirlwind of cringe, with the pretty boy getting sent off to Team Rocket's hideout after an excessive amount of pelvic thrusting and throwing roses at Cell proves ineffective. Butterbean was just as embarrassing when he gets KO'd instantly off of the force of Cell's hockey when he attempts his finishing move and unexpectedly winds up dead in the water. With his disciples proving to be catastrophic failures, this leaves Satan with no choice to put down his glass of Merlot and take up a fighting stance, because it looks like the Earth's greatest last hope is going to have to step up after after all. With the entirety of humanity chanting Satan in desperate anticipation of the warrior's victory, Satan dashes in and mounts his offensive, delivering a ruthless flurry of kicks to Cell's dome, and the android seemingly powerless to do a thing about it. All seems to be going according to the Earth Savior's plan, until in a flash, Perfect Green delivers a swipe that sends Hercule into orbit, rendering him out of bounds and disqualified, and humanity without a hope left. My gassing of Satan aside, we really do got to talk about the strays this man was catching from the Z Fighters, because if there is one thing this arc taught me, it's that these fellows cannot stand to see someone without hands playing the hero. After seeing that man get swatted, Krillin leans over to Gohan as like, look, don't judge me, young blood. Before a second there, if someone told you I was rooting for Cell, they wouldn't have been lying. Big Green took it a step further, mentioning how he was upset that the dude lived somehow after getting swatted. And with the Earth's reigning martial arts champion out of the way now, the fate of the Earth is now left in the hands of the Earth's secondary squad. 
and as planned originally, it looks like Son Goku will be stepping up to the plate first. As Goku diligently steps forward for battle, a distinct change in the atmosphere of the arena can immediately be felt. It appears at last the battle for Earth's future will begin in earnest, and it all rests in the hands of this lone, golden-haired warrior. And right here, homies, at the calm before the storm of the boxing match of the century is where we'll end it. Here we are, friends, at the long-awaited climax of the arc as the Cell games have finally begun in earnest. As it stands, Goku is currently Earth's best chance of survival. What hidden tricks does Goku have up his sleeve that have allowed him to remain so calm? And will they finally be unveiled? Guess we'll have to tune in and find out. Be easy, y'all. Thanks as always, and I'll catch you again in the next video.